From what we've seen in the Testament, Solomon had overcome every obstacle that he was faced with. Not only had he successfully established peace in Israel, but he had also overcome every demon that had presented before him. From the prince of all demons himself in Beelzebub, to the more malignant demons like Asmodeus, Solomon overcame them. Demon dogs were not able to stall him, demon lions could not cause him to waver, and not even demon dragons were able to subdue him. Solomon had resisted the temptations of the demons, had seen past their lies, and was not intimidated by their threats. In other words, Solomon had proven himself to be an ideal subject of God, the very pinnacle of which his common man could and should have aspired to be like. Solomon had shown to be brave in the face of his adversaries, had outwitted the spirits that came to haunt him, and even when it seemed like the odds were against him, he prevailed by calling upon the grace of God and never forgetting that God was with him. We see that this remains to be the case in the opening of the final section of the Testament, where after having defeated every demon, he does not forget God and certainly understands that without his Lord, he would not be in the fortunate position that he is in. He continues to owe all glory to God, saying, And I, Solomon, glorified God, and adorned the temple of the Lord with all fair seeming. And I was glad in spirit in my kingdom, and there was peace in my days. Solomon, for all his victories, shows us that one should remain humble and not lose sight of faith, even if one has achieved everything he had set out to do. He continues that he took wives from every land, those that were numberless, and that in the years after his encounters with the demons, he marched upon the Jebusians, where he laid eyes on a Jebusian woman, a woman he fell violently in love with. The Testament of Solomon does not seem to identify who these Jebusian people were, but some have theorized that they were the pious people of Shunem, or that the woman Solomon fell for was the woman of Shunammite, considering she is later identified as a Shunammite. We know of the woman of Shunammite from the second book of Kings, 4.8, where she assists the prophet Elisha and is thereafter described as a great woman, but this idea has little merit. As far as the testament goes, the Jebusians are a neighbouring people, and there just so happens to be one beautiful enough to catch Solomon's wandering eye. You'll notice that Solomon tells us he took wives from every land, and that when he saw this new woman, he desired to take her as his wife, amongst all his other wives. Now, this might merely be a representation of Solomon's appetite for women. He is king after all, and some might say he could have as many wives as he wanted. I mean, he had saved Israel from the demons, and appeared to be a decent enough leader given that he restored peace upon the land. But others see Solomon's appetite here as not a sign of status, but instead a sign of greed. We've seen demonstrations of Solomon's greediness in the form of gold, whereby he goes as far as to listen to the demons and seek their counsel in finding buried treasure. We also see him instruct his servant when trapping Epiphas that he should trick the demon into speaking of any areas of the land that has gold, so that he might be able to obtain more of it. Gold appears to certainly motivate Solomon, amongst the building of the temple for his god, and he isn't too fussed about where or how it is obtained, even if it means conspiring with spirits. But now we see such greediness extend to women as he becomes lustful, evidently unsatisfied by the many women he already has, and insatiable in his thirst as he leers at the next flavour of the week. Some might argue that he's already showing two signs of major sin through this passage alone, greed and lust, two of our greatest downfalls. He says to the priests of the woman, those who are identified as priests of Moloch, a Canaanite god associated with child sacrifice, give me the Shunammite to wife. Here we see that the woman Solomon lusts after is a worshipper of what he would identify as a false god. She and her people are sinners, in that they pay homage to a different god, and therefore would be considered infidels, enemies, and not the sort that one like Solomon would be keen on suffering. The fact that he's lusting after the enemy at all shows us how much he is faltering off his righteous path. It's not just the lust that is the problem either, but that he's actually facilitating the idea 
by asking of her to be his wife. He appears to become blinded by her beauty, so much so that he forgets all about God and that this very act is something that his Lord would not be pleased with. But some might say that this is a reflection of the temptation we might feel and that it can be so strong that we can lose sight of our own values and seek gratification even though it might go against our best intentions. Such is the power of temptation, and the story shows us that if it can trip up a man like Solomon, it can surely trip you up as well. But despite Solomon's requests, he is denied, and the priests of Moloch tell him, If thou lovest this maiden, go in and worship our gods, the great god Raphan, and the god called Moloch. It is here that Solomon is reminded of his own god, and realises his own behaviour is not one that God would condone. He quickly comes to his senses and remembers how much God has done for him, not to mention how powerful his God is. He states, I therefore was in fear of the glory of God, and I did not follow to worship, and I said to them, I will not worship a strange God. Solomon shows resolve here. He sidesteps the burning temptation within and shows us how disciplined he is, how God-fearing he is, and sets a standard that all believers ought to follow when it comes to the temptation of flesh. And this would be a great way to end the testament, right? Solomon showing us that despite the ring of Archangel Michael, despite the spirit of God, and despite any of his tricks against the demons, all a man needed to overcome his adversities was conviction and the fear of God. But this episode isn't titled The Downfall of Solomon for no reason. The priests recognise Solomon's resolve and shrug their shoulders. They turn around and head back to their temple, but not before they tell Solomon that until he worships and makes a sacrifice to their god, he will never sleep with the maiden that he desires. It is here that Solomon is hit with disappointment. He tells us, I then was moved, but crafty Eros brought and laid by her, for me, five grasshoppers, saying, Take these grasshoppers and crush them together, in the name of the god Moloch, and I will sleep with you. Here we see Solomon visited by a character known as Eros, and while we don't see Solomon explain who Eros is, we do know of an Eros from Roman mythology, his Greek equivalent of course being Cupid. As we know, Cupid shoots his target with an arrow, and of course the victim becomes infatuated. We know the testament is heavily inspired by Greek mythology, so it is not so out of the realm to see Solomon acknowledge one of these deities. Solomon here refers to Eros as crafty, suggesting that he was aware of the deity and knew not to trust him. But of course, after having heard Eros's offer, which some might say was Solomon being shot by his arrow, Solomon becomes entranced. Eros tells him, take these grasshoppers and crush them together in the name of the god Moloch, and I will sleep with you. This is where the text does get slightly confusing, because there is an implication here that Eros embodies the woman who Solomon desires, or that she herself was Eros but in the form of a beautiful woman. There is also an idea that Eros had somehow manipulated the woman, perhaps by shooting her with an arrow too, and that he was puppeteering her in an attempt to seduce Solomon. Another idea linking back to the Seven Sisters, most notably the Seventh Sister, is that she had escaped Solomon's binding and had transformed herself into this woman in question. The reasoning for this is because earlier in the testament she had told Solomon in her interrogation, I am the worst, and I make thee worse off than thou wast, because I will impose the bonds of Artemis, but the locust will set me free, for by means thereof is it fated that thou shalt achieve my desire. For if one were wise, he would not turn his step towards me. Some suggest that the five locusts which Solomon is asked to crush in the name of Moloch are actually the grasshoppers that the Seventh Sister speaks of. She predicted here that Solomon would indeed crush the grasshoppers and that through these grasshoppers she will be set free and she will achieve her desire, that being of course, in this instance, to see Solomon fall. She even warns him that it is not wise for him to step against her, suggesting that in the end, she would be triumphant. As far as the sacrifice to Moloch goes, Solomon regretfully tells us, 
And this I actually did, and at once the Spirit of God departed from me, and I became weak as well as foolish in my words. And after that, I was obliged by her to build a temple of idols, to Baal, to Rapha, to Moloch, and to the other idols. Oh dear Solomon. It's interesting to note that the moment he makes this crucial mistake, God does not hesitate to abandon him. There is no message from God, no punishment, no anger, no nothing. God literally just leaves him. This is actually quite compelling given that we often see God come to berate his subjects when they betray him. With Solomon though, he simply just ditches him, perhaps showing us an even greater level of disappointment. In this, God has no words for Solomon, and you might say his silence speaks louder than any of the words he might have otherwise delivered. We also learn that Solomon, after all his enslaving of demons, essentially becomes enslaved himself, as he is obliged to build temples in the names of the woman's gods. Perhaps the worst thing about all of this is that Solomon's work in imprisoning the demons literally was for nothing in the end, for there is an implication in the final sentences of the testament that after the spirit of God leaves Solomon, so does his power, that which was the only thing keeping the demons bound. I then, wretch that I am, followed her advice, and the glory of God quite departed from me, and my spirit was darkened, and I became the sport of idols and demons. Here we see Solomon recognize that he has done wrong, and we learn that despite knowing this, he carries on following the woman's advice, because he is now helpless, weak, and entirely alone. We learn that his spirit is darkened, suggesting that he has now damned himself beyond any redemption, and in a cruel twist of irony, he is now sport for the very demons he had once condemned. With the knowledge that he has failed not only his God, but also himself and his people, Solomon can do nothing but lament and contemplate on his own shortcomings. His last words, perhaps the last noble words of our once glorious protagonist, are those that seek to warn us of his follies, in the dire hope that others will not make the same mistakes that he did. He states, Wherefore I wrote out this testament, that ye who get possession of it may pity, and attend to the last things and not to the first, so that ye may find grace for ever and ever. Amen. And so concludes the Testament of Solomon, and we close this series with a sense of tragedy of a man who had the most honourable intentions and a pious nature, only to be worn down and overcome by the very evil he sought to stamp out. The Testament shows believers that the power of demons is not something that one should scoff at, considering that they were, in the end, able to corrupt Solomon and ultimately win him over. It also seeks to warn believers of the pitfalls of greed and temptation, most notably the temptation of flesh, and that it takes the strongest of wills and the strongest of faiths in order to resist the cunning of both spirits and our fellow man. Let me know what you thought about the final episode of the Testament of Solomon, and what sort of text you'd like me to cover next. As always, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.